Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. And you know, an, an irony, God, the ironies are going to fly here. The irony is, um, went to a low carb diet because he was exposed, or he was scanned with fatty liver and his gamma glutamyl transferase was up over 100. And I told him, that's fatty liver, right? That's diabetes. Yeah. He went on a low carb diet for just four to six weeks, collapsed all of his bad markers, GGT and I think ferritin, and everything looked fantastic. The doctor got a shock, but his bilirubin had gone up significantly. Yeah. So I mean, which may, may have been if just you, a further, if you're but... under less oxidant stress, yeah. then you might not be uh, depleting it as much. Obviously, there's other pathways involved mm. in bilirubin circulation, but uh... yeah. But I guess it seemed to be when it goes up, it's a bad thing. But just to well, your it's point... a little bit like uric acid. I mean, we always mm. associate uric acid as being deleterious because it's associated with gout, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But uric acid is also an antioxidant. I'll tell you some other ones is melatonin is a powerful antioxidant. And there's nice evidence there that that actually can uh, reduce damage. Now, and absolutely, I've heard that. Now I will, and if with good sleep cycles and all, you probably optimize your melatonin compared to shift working and all the other negative mm. effects of bad sleep. But um, all of the antioxidants you're talking about now, they're endogenous, internal, made by your body antioxidants, mm. which can be very powerful. I think though the external antioxidants that industry portion nutraceuticals I think they have very limited effectiveness compared to endogenous what you're talking about. I think about. I have to agree but oh. I, I would probably extend something a little bit mm. further so rather than talking about antioxidant we we'll talk about anti-glycation and there is a substance I don't know if you've heard of carnosine now that's yeah. carnosine with an s not carnitine everybody confuses the two that's actually been shown to be a, a glycation inhibitor and it can actually reverse glycation as well. And it's been shown to lower HbA1c in type one diabetics. And it's also been shown to reduce kidney damage. So, uh, and the way I think that, you know, it has all of these benefits, the downstream benefits is by interfering with glycation on LDL particles. And it has been shown to interfere with glycation of LDL particles. Then you prevent the downstream effects of the oxidation and the subsequent damage. Well, the whole cascade, you cut it off at the knees somewhat. Mm. So, Do and it. I guess yeah. that that is an ex exogenous supplement, which I occasionally, if I've got a patient who I consider particularly high risk and I see a hell of a lot of glycation or oxidation when I have a look at their lipid profile, then I, I often do recommend um, substances to inhibit glycation and to inhibit oxidation while they're in a high risk phase. Mm. Excellent. And you know what, Karen has seen you immediately rang a bell there because several months ago I met a couple from England who uh, they're promoting an Eastern European developed uh, scanner. I think you connect to your ankle and elsewhere. But they were saying that exactly that, that carnosine in high doses, higher than the recommended doses, has a dramatic antioxidant effect. Mm -hmm. And I was meeting with them quite briefly and I thought afterwards, did they mean carnitine? But I said, no, they did say carnosine and I intended looking it up, but I never got a chance. Yeah, well, it's mm. just, it's two amino acids complex together. It's a pretty simple substance. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, but carnitine is the one that always springs yeah. to mind and the carnitine well, shuttle and all that stuff. Well, carnitine is actually, I mean, I'm, I'm a sports medicine physician. So I, uh, what gets me out of bed in the morning is, you know, treating athletes and trying to optimize their performance. And we're actually uh, mucking around a little bit at the moment, seeing if we can just eke a little bit of extra fat metabolism out of some of our elite athletes by using carnitine. Oh, carnitine specifically. Carnitine, yeah. Well, because yeah. I mean, once you get up to about the two grams a minute, you basically top out of your, your fatty acid oxidation. So we're just trying to, obviously, if you can, uh, if we can enhance that, then you can mm. run along at a higher VO2 for a little bit longer. Excellent. Well, that sounds like really interesting work. That's a bit and of a digression. Yeah. Well, it's inherently safe as well, but carnitine, there's something else about carnitine. Um, oh, it um, escapes me now, but uh, no, it'll come back to me later. So carnosine is the supplement. Then there's mm. glutathione, the body's primary antioxidant. Yeah, yeah. Now that, that's pretty central, right? That's kind of the central processor of... Yeah, well, this is an mm. antioxidant. And I mean, I mean, this just leads to so much. It's involved, vitamin C is involved in the production of glutathione as well. Mm. Um, 
And funnily enough, there's a strong relationship between need for vitamin C and uh, your oxidant state, um, possibly due to the need to uh, generate more glutathione. Um, I mean, that uh, we could diverge here and talk about a condition called favism or uh, intolerance of broad beans, which is a genetic condition where people have broad beans and they, uh, they have so much oxidant stress, they deplete all their glutathione and uh, essentially they destroy their uh, red blood cells. Wow. Um, so, I mean, you can see what happens uh, when, if you don't have enough glutathione and it's not that it's a deficient state of glutathione, it's just that it just ran out. You, you, it's essentially running out. And I know the reason I got into uh, biochemical research and all this six years ago is I had a very elevated gamma glutamyl transferase. Mm. And that, of course, creates glutathione and it can also break down glutathione. Yeah. So if you have a high GGT, it's a screaming uh, indicator that you are depleting or overly needing glutathione mm. and the liver damage that often ties into many of these issues. So there are a lot of these measurements and, and things that people aren't really aware of because there's too much talk on cholesterol. and. I mean, we could other... spend an hour just talking about the different liver enzymes. I mean, they yeah. all have different functions. They all mean different things. And they're all really important, but yeah. they're undervalued. Yeah. Well, if you understand what the different patterns mean, um, mm. I mean, it's really valuable information. So, I mean, and it depends on the patient too. So if somebody comes in and they like to have a bit of a tipple, um, that's significant because GGT is an enzyme is what we call inducible. Yeah. That means that if you're having a lot of alcohol, the amount of GGT will actually increase as a part of the body's need to process that alcohol. Um, whereas some of the other liver enzymes, if we have a look at AST and ALT, then they're actually uh, contained within hepatocytes and they get released into the circulation when the hepatocyte dies. Think of it bursting open and the chemicals mm. release into the blood. So a lot of the enzymes that we actually test for, we actually, we're looking for an increase and we infer that if they're present in the circulation at a higher level than they ought be, then the cell that was originally containing that has died. So cellular damage increases in the liver and you get these elevated liver enzymes essentially. Yeah. 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 And it's very important. Yeah. GGT was classically used for a long time to find alcoholics or check whether they were back on the wagon. I still use it as a flag. Yeah. The irony is though, even with no alcohol, for instance, practically doesn't drink. He was over a hundred mm. and it was this fatty liver. So it's an oxidant stress though. And yeah. when he took away the oxidant stress, his bile went up. Funnily Absolutely. enough, and because he, there's less need to use the, the antioxidant of capacity of the bile. Exactly. And he was eating a lot of actually watching movies uh, on television. He was eating a lot of ice creams and he was eating a lot of chocolate. And mm. he was a, a devil, as we say, a devil for fruit juice. He drank a ton of fruit juice yeah. and he thought it was healthy. He thought it was this five a day. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but the, this misinformation is out there on so many foods. Oh, it's amazing. Mm. And I mean, the, the funny thing is, um, even doctors, uh, just because we go to med school, I mean, uh, I'm just telling you the bleeding obvious here doesn't mean we know dork about any of this. We literally don't, we don't, we have no training in us. No, but your, your personal research through the databases, the publications and your patients, you've generated an enormous amount of knowledge in fairness. But as you say, how much of that really came from medical school? It sounds like. Well, I'm actually, look, I've just finished a fellowship a, a year and a bit ago. A, mm. uh, you know, that's a four year specialization on top of when you finish your other earlier training. Mm. And that's one of the only two specialties in Australia that has a formal nutrition component. And I can tell you without a shadow of doubt that what I learned was out of bollocks. And I'm currently in conversation with the, uh, uh, the seniority within the college to actually uh, rewrite some of their curriculum, which will, for a specialist medical college, um, you know, I, I, to be honest, I'm not holding my breath, but if mm. we could have a, a, a low carb friendly medical curriculum within a specialist medical college, I mean, that'll be a real feather in the cap. Wow, it would. Congratulations. But I mean, that's a huge movement. But what you're saying is bollocks. I mean, they're essentially giving out the same old food pyramid style nutritional belief system, which is less than worthless. Yeah, look, mm. look there is some some movement um, towards where the evidence is, but it's sort of like, you know, two steps forward, one step back, 
and being dragged along kicking and screaming. There's certainly not a wholesale embrace of the literature. And I, I've been, it was just actually last week, I, I had a few more emails and so inviting me to review the curriculum for them. And I, I guess I'm sort of testing the waters a little bit and saying, well, you know, how keen are you to actually, because you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> Mm. Uh, is there the political will there to actually uh, change things if they do need to be changed? And uh, that I'm not so sure about. We'll see what happens. Well, anyway, this is always going to be challenging, but it's great to see some movements within it. So what will we jump to now? This will be a real jumper around our well, LDLP, maybe, the particle oh, count. Yeah. That's very topical. Well, it's topical, and I, I think it's, as the conclusion you've come to, and we had a a pre-broadcast conversation, I think is absolutely correct. All it is, if you understand you have the LDL particles in circulation and they're healthy, and when they've delivered all their cargo, dropped off their triglycerides where they need to be, then they go back to the liver. So you've got this receptor on the outside of them called the ApoB100, and that binds to the LDL receptor in the liver. It's a doorway, it's like a security swipe, goes back into the liver, take it out of circulation. Now, the only thing that will stop it from leaving the circulation is if that ApoB100, that security swipe card, is damaged. And that can be damaged by glycation. And so essentially, if you damage it by glycation, your LDL particles will accumulate in the circulation. But they won't be the big ones. Because as you know, when you glycate an LDL particle, it actually changes the size just fractionally to the point of where it's called small dense. So it, it's a nanometer kind of reduction. And as well as that, it's the LDL that's already delivered its cargo. So it already started out as the smallest a physiological yeah. LDL particle would be, and then you made it a little bit smaller with glycation. So if you actually were to take all of these LDL particles that are accumulating and building up and put them in a glass jar, they wouldn't actually take up that much volume because they're all smaller. So that's why the LDL particle count is actually a better marker than total volume of LDL. Of LDL cholesterol, of yeah. Of LDL cholesterol, yeah. And just for people watching, the classic LDL measure was LDLC, where you smashed up all the particles per unit blood volume and found out how much cholesterol molecules were inside them. But the LDLP, as you say, is counting the particles the themselves. The particle number, not... Yeah. yeah, so if you just get them all and smushed them in a jar and said it takes up this much room, that's the total volume of LDL, but that, that's not useful because the LDL particles might be really big. They might be carrying a lot of cargo and they might be undamaged. They might, and most crucially is that latter point, they may be undamaged or they may be damaged LDL. So if you have a guy who's got a 2200 count and another guy who's a 2200 count, mm. orthodox medicine I fear sometimes thinks, well, they're both high score, they both have a high risk. One guy has no glycated, no damaged LDLs, and his glycocalyx and endothelium is all in great shape, blah, blah, blah. And his HDL is working fantastic to efflux any that get into the wall, right? The other yeah. guy beside him, everything could be in a mess. One guy is really high risk, one guy is not high risk. Mm. But if you just look at the number, you don't know. Yeah, that, I mean, that's true. That's true. Mm. I mean, I really like, um, we do, a, I do a couple of tests. I do a, a lipid subfraction mm. where we actually fractionate it. it. Basically, it's pretty simple. You just, uh, you put the substance in a gel and you centrifuge it through and it will travel down through the gel based on its density, basically. Mm. Um, you can do electrolysis where it, it separates out based on charge, but I, I just like the density. Then the particles get separated out by size. And as in addition to that, I can do a special test for oxidized LDL using monoclonal antibodies um, that will bind to the, the, the antigen or the epitopes on oxidized LDL. So I combine those two tests and I also, you know, I've got the benefit. I can do APO, I can do A1, which is found on HDL. I can do B100 and I can do LP little a. So I'm so lucky as a medical doctor, I can actually have a patient come in and I can do a complete analysis. And I'll be honest though, most of the time I have people seek me out, they know I'm, a, I'm relatively knowledgeable about cholesterol and they say, my GP wants to put me on a statin, I need you to reassure me, you know, I need you to do all these testing on me. Mm. Nine times out of 10, I say, you can do the testing, it'll cost you this much money, I don't recommend it. And the reason is because we can usually infer enough, the people that seek me out are usually on a healthy diet, they're usually ketogenic, they usually got a triglyceride that's as low as you like, 
and a HDL that's outside the normal range being high. So we can just we can run the metrics there and we can just play probabilities. And we can say, almost certainly, your profile is going to be okay. So every self, look, a lot of people come in there and just say, look, I understand the theory, but I just want the comfort that I get from seeing a pretty colored graph, uh, you know, or what have you, and uh, we'll often do that. But usually, I actually recommend people not to do it simply because they'd be better off spending that money on a massage. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.